G'day, good morning, good evening, good night, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to Saturday Sessions 10, we're in the double digits. Tonight we've got Eric Willicke, Rebecca Davis and myself, Mark Richards. And we thought about all the topics we would talk about tonight and went, let's go random. So no doubt we'll find something to get deep into discussion on. And uh, let's kick off highlights of the week. Rebecca, what were your highlights? Um... I guess from a work perspective, it was exciting getting the first AI webinar out to the wild that we've been working on and really exciting. I think they said it was like 900 or 2,000 people that ended up going, so that felt really cool. Um, and just starting to see that work culminate and definitely not done. So I spent the most of my the rest of my week doing more work on uh, AI and workshopping and things like that. So it was pretty cool. From a personal point of view, um, my husband had this week off, um, so he got lots of stuff done around the house, which was a big highlight for me, <laughs> and we got to do a lot more just, like, fun things together um, when I was off, so as it is. Yeah. It feels like no matter how hard you try to escape joining the AI obsession, you can't escape joining the AI obsession, doesn't it? Uh, I will admit, at the very beginning of this year, I was reluctant to join the AI obsession. Um, I am no longer, I'll say that for sure, with the amount of, not just because of time invested, of course, but when I'm investing the time in doing the research and doing all of the, reading all of the articles and participating in videos and all that, it's an exciting time to be alive. It's an exhausting time to be alive. Our whole team this week was like, the age of AI is fast, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's pretty cool too. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing as people figure out new applications for it. Um, speaking of which, Eric, highlights of your week. And you need to remember push to talk, my friend. You know, I'm just going to turn it off while there's three of us until we get into exciting topics. The um, I, I hear you saying that I'm a new AI application. Is that is that what you were trying to connect there? So, um, so what, I, what I can tell you is I had a moment this, to, today that I managed to resist because I was watching a YouTube by a streaming guy about a new filter that does AI voices. And he was running through how you train it on your own voice and then how you pick other voices. And I had flashbacks to Rebecca's desire to pay money to see three of us on a boat in a performance. And I went, wouldn't it be interesting if we recorded, trained an AI for each other's voices, and then we mucked around with a stream where I spoke with Eric's voice and Eric spoke with mine. <laughs> I might can pay I, money for that, too, to be honest. Can I, can I have Rebecca's voice? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's just creepy. <laughs> that actually could be a heck of a lot of fun. Um, almost like we we like do a collective writing or do writing exercises, but then randomize who wh whose voice is used to share it out as a way of um, almost an anti diversity thing, like a diversity activity, like rewrite the voice to anonymize who's saying it, evaluate based on the actual knowledge and content in an interview setting, then go back through. It's like, okay, you selected this candidate that you you didn't have a stereotypical belief for. Like there's, a, there's actually a diversity filter tool hiding in there somewhere. Like you interview an AI voice, not a person that will trigger all of your presuppositions about what that person must do or whatever. Um, but I don't you, want to go there. I want to talk you, about my week. You're just you're just back wanting Rebecca's voice now. <laughs> I, I, I kind of do want. <laughs> um, also, to have conversations with y'all when you're not around that would be kind of cool too. <laughs> um, you're really bland right now. Oh yeah, this is AI Rebecca. <laughs> 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 um, turn the SAS filters up. I'm sure. SAS filters, uh, theoretically, X guys, AI does that. But we're... anyway, um, my week, uh, I found Flow again. 
it, this is this is the week that Flow came back after a week and a half of weird disruption and like knocked out a solid chapter in the book and really happy with that. Where that's flowing, got coach on the couches every day and didn't feel like I was pushing and ob there was no obligating it. It was just kind of like, oh yeah, it's time to go sit down and talk. Oh, I want to talk about this today. And it was, there wasn't any struggle there. Um, yesterday was fascinating because um, this is probably what you're pointing at, Mark. I, I spent, I set the entire day aside uh, for AI. It's like, okay, I haven't, I've, I've grazed, I've consumed the passive flow. I've thought about it as an architect for a while. Uh, but I hadn't sat down and actually gone deep on what's available now. I did that six, eight months ago, which is like two massive generations of everything ago. <laughs> um, and that that was fascinating from a personal productivity point of view to just to look at what's out there in a new way. And um, interestingly, and this might be a fun conversation that turned into being a three hour personal value stream mapping session before I actually got into AI. So uh, of course it did, because I'm a coach maybe, but uh, some ins insights there. Yeah, it's been a good week. Oh, and I had my first um, person, I had my first uh, high speed dismount since I arrived in Baja uh, off my one wheel. And most of me is fine. My lower back is gently tweaked and I'm waiting to see what happens with my left knee. Um, but it was I have to share, cruising. the more I hear you and Carol talk about one wheels, the more dangerous they tend to sound. Occasionally. I mean, not, <laughs> much, much better than driving race cars, I'm sure. But mm, Not sure. I haven't been hurt yet. <laughs> Sorry. Mark. Well, I was just going to share with Rebecca the fun moment we had this morning, because in the world of our time zone crossovers, we we chat as I go to bed, and then Eric has the most productive part of his day while I'm asleep. And uh, <clears throat> this morning it was like, so how did the day of AI go? Because he described it as building Eric GPT. Anyway, here's a link. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went, okay. all right, let me do some testing. And so I thought of asking some Eric type questions. And going, what's the difference between what Eric GPT gives back and generic chat GPT gives back? Can I see his influence in his predilection turn up? And it was really interesting. It was not blatant, but it was very obvious when you ask the two questions. Like the one that I decided was a doozy was, you know, if you look at Jacqueline Novogratz's Manifesto for Moral Revolution and identify the key principles it can use to guide a lean agile transformation, what would they be? And comparing the focus of the insight that came out from the two descriptions, like Bland Chat GPT did a good job. Eric Chat GPT very obviously did an Eric job. Um, so. <laughs> what that means uh, a lot of big words mm. <laughs> explained very gracefully of course but lots of big words actually it wasn't too bad that's awesome. big words. what else did you ask it now i'm just curious uh look that's the main one eric asked it one about the journey of a lace leader and the key steps in the playbook mm. and it played that back beautifully but i felt like that was cheating because knowing the content he was uploading it to, to it. That was really just saying, give me a playback of content I've uploaded to you. Uh, yeah, that was, that was more of a test case than a fair test of like its integration with the global knowledge base. So I tried a few random questions and there was some where it was like, yeah, you know, looks like what naked chat GPT would have built. Um, but it was interesting enough to go, okay, when I allow myself new whip and rabbit holes, that Mark GPT is coming. So, Is that like a swim lane on your Kanban board? Rabbit holes versus new whip? Uh, yeah. <laughs> How many rabbit holes can you take on at a time? Two. 
It's a pretty good number, actually. One, one, one free charm. You just kind of reach in, you find the interesting <laughs> things. <laughs> but what I find when I go down a rabbit hole is, is like I disappear for six, seven, eight hours. Mm. And then there comes a moment, like you can go out, you can make a hot drink, you can come back without really leaving the zone. But there's a, cut, there's a moment where you, you come up and it's really intense when you come out of that long in the zone. And so I like to be able to go the next rabbit hole I disappear into. I want to be a different one because I'm not quite ready to plumb that depth again in the last one. That might seem weird, but. No, I don't think it seems weird. I mean, when our, and the team I'm on is actually really focusing and in flow. We're spending, you know, two days a week together and other days in, in honestly, like, research rabbit holes, right? And then we come back and share. And I, I think that it's the come back and share that to your point is like, it's a little scary. It's a little intense, honestly, because you have all this knowledge that you now want to use and you see things in slightly different ways. And I think doing that as a team is one of the most motivating things I get to do all the time. But it's also one of the things that's like, just a really a lot. <laughs> yeah. You've now got five different people to you know, explain things with and talk through things with who were doing their own research over the last few days as well. It's actually a little bit of, I just had a flashback to the old XP days when mm -hmm. teams that did full-time pair programming struggled to do full eight hour days because it was so intense. The flow mm -hmm. that they got into as a pair that, you know, six hours was enough. And yeah, I feel that yeah. deeply. I, I think Mondays, there's a, I've actually started to vocalize a time of day, not every not the same time every day, but there is a time of the days that we spend all day together where I have to be like, I actually can't take any more input right now because I'm not taking it well. Like I'm just not able to take it well right now. It's been too much, but I think that's okay. I hope it's okay. Cause that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Uh, introverts need explicit coping techniques. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day. Is that, is that an introvert thing, though? Or is that a my brain's full and I'm tired thing? I don't know. How many non-introverts do you hang out with? Veronica? Oh, that's fair. <laughs> can you can she's easily spend eight hours all day with you. <laughs> and also, fantastic example. Um, but but we, wear, we wear each other out. Like, when we would go deep yeah. on stuff, like, brain gets full and I, mm -hmm. I think about intense social times where the the extroverts want to go to bed not because they are done talking to people but because they're just that flipping tired brain is full <laughs> yeah 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 um, i think there's so something to so there's like we talk about cognitive load but there's just also just like cognitive consumption like my brain has been used up for today and yeah like uh, we both know Cheryl and uh, my partner Chelsea. Look at the end of the day, and they're just out of words. Like you can watch them. It's like, yeah, and there's the end of the words. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a well well known phrase in my house. No more words. <laughs> yeah. If I've had a really good day of facilitation or training, there there won't be any words left in me until I've had two or three hours of not speaking, and the whole family knows it. <clears throat> I still have words. They just won't be in any normal language. I'll just do a lot of like muttering and like tiger sounds pretty much. <laughs> hmm. A whole new visual. Can, can we, can we yeah. get them trained on the AI as well? Yes. That would be amazing. Eric, isn't it? Eric does really good voice. Tiger language AI. It's I like, think that would well, be great. Or, or an AI that's like... E I'm out of words because you're clearly too tired to ask good questions. Oh, that would be intelligent. <laughs> it's especially, I, I do run into those sometimes, like the ones where you ask it something and it says like, I'm, I'm not allowed to answer that because of the way I'm programmed or whatever, mm -hmm. which I find interesting. Mark, did you ever actually tell us about your highlights for this week? No. Or just Eric's highlights for his week? Well, you know, I, I, I shared moments of Eric's highlights, so... You know, <laughs> give, 
Given that we're that on a, a kind of let's follow the, the path of a fun discussion tonight, I mean, I'm going to stay and uh, share the moments because, you know, he downplayed out how much he geeked out while he was doing that. So, oh, and he did, and he did, an he did geek topic. out. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what, though, on the, on the, before you go into that, on the topic of tiredness and geeking out, I, I, it is when you're in the mode of creation and putting things out. Spending a day actively pulling things in is exhausting in a different way. Like the directionality of learning and creating is like I was wiped out by like 5.30 or 6 yesterday after eight hours of trying to learn a whole bunch of stuff and just maintaining really focused thought in ways I wasn't after days of writing and creating and moving around a bunch of different ideas. But I think there's an interesting read there in terms of what you did with that day and it ties back to and i forget the exact quote now from the fifth discipline that notion of the fact that when you're energized by pursuing a goal you learn new things much more rapidly in pursuit of the goal so and boy, I recognize that the example he gives is, you know, somebody's about to go to Mexico, they learn Spanish much faster than a lot of people would learn Spanish when they're learning it because they want to learn Spanish because they've got a reason they're wanting to learn it. And, you know, I recognize that so much in the things that I learned, not because I wanted to learn the thing, but because I wanted to be able to use the thing to do the thing that I was actually energized by and the different energy that comes with that. And the fact that, you know, you started with three hours of value stream mapping, right? You're in creativity mode. Your experiment was, how can AI help me with the workflow of my creativity mode? And so it was actually a very clearly linked thing that was taking you in there at that depth and focusing it. True. So I think if you had a random day of let's play with AI, you probably would have had a very different feeling at the end of the day than running a very focused experiment. Probably, because I've done those random access days plenty of times, random books, whatever. But the idea of integrating it into potential behavior. It's, it's, um, yeah, I do think it's similar to building your own workshop, basically. Like when we ask people to workshop, we give them a task to do in order to learn, to learn whatever concept. And it's, to me, the same, like when we're Notice as we test or when we're watching people test as they're building AI tools um, and they're saying like, just, you know, I built this chat thing, like go and use it. The questions that they're getting back are very thin. Um, so it's not testing it as deeply as we need it to test. But then when I say like, hey, like this thing's about to come up, use it to use it to more creatively uh, do that thing. Um, then we start to get depth and we start to get like real questions that people are asking. Um, and I think it's the same as when you think about workshopping, like you're trying to get people to do something experientially because it's going to sink in deeper. Mm, that's an interesting thread there. You guys you both want... have thinking faces. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm looking to go, do we sit here or do we move on? Well, let's hear how Mark is and then we'll, we've got some topics seated just from our, <laughs> how was our weeks so, as expected? Yeah. Mm. Uh, how do I describe it? I'm just going to pick one highlight. One highlight has been actually the unexpected insights for that came out of the first the preparation for the first real SPCs unleashed. Um, unfortunately, Miro had scheduled maintenance, so the first episode of a real dimension is happening tomorrow instead of tonight. Um. But we all sat on Discord and, and just riffed for an hour anyway about what's happening for us through this lens of doing a very structured deep dive on a single dimension. And it's been a really interesting experience. Um, I, I had flashbacks at various moments when we were talking about the new framework articles last week, Eric, and mm -hmm. that notion of what sits in the portfolio article versus what sits in the lean portfolio management article and things living in their rightful home, 
but understanding the context within which that rifle home exists. And <clears throat> I know I, I went and I just, because I had a template for, you know, this is the way we'll structure the information for the show. I went, well, let me test the template. I'll start doing, even though I'm not the first up, I'll start doing Agile teams just to test the template. And as I was testing it going, no, what's important, what's important, what's important. I kept wanting to put a, all kinds of stuff out that wasn't Agile teams, right? For example, boy, did I want to talk about built-in quality. <laughs> and I just had to keep reminding myself, no, 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 that's another dimension. Um, and, you know, what's the real laser focus of Agile teams? And, and I wound up in this place where no, I won't go that deep. I'll stay surface, right? It triggered really interesting things contextually for me. And then Stefan was first up with the real topic. And he struggled from exactly the same thing. I, I looked at his first drop of information and I went, wow, you're just all over the competency map. Because I, I looked and I had, had in my head this kind of Thing that I'd really grapple with on the way to the focus. And, and he had a whole bunch of stuff from other dimensions, other competencies. And so we had this backwards and forwards around, you know, the laser focus on the dimension and then actually starting to think about the connection between the dimensions. So that <clears throat> very structured, trying to be laser focused, recognize what's here and how it connects to what's there. The conversation that Stefan and Nico and I had when we were meant to be streaming was about the unexpected learning for ourselves as we prepared to impart learning for others. Um, so, you know, I had fun. I learned the deck agreed. I had other things that were interesting this week. But if I went to what was the kind of pick of a highlight learning moment, uh, that was probably it. Um... I'm smiling as I hear that because I don't, I don't think that was something I realized as like as much when I was using using safe because using safe is you're grabbing all the pieces and you're you're using them together, right? Yeah. Um, writing safe is you're picking the one thing and you and you need to talk about that one thing. You can't you can't do the I'm going to talk about all the things in one inside of one article, which is why they're so hard to get to the right length and the right point. So I love that you guys went through that. I think it, I mean, it is, I think both ways of thinking about it are, are really important. I love what you said about, you know, this one area, this one dimension and thinking about how it then also does connect to everything else so that you can explain it back. But in the moment, what's, what is the, you know, the purity of that one dimension? Why does it exist and what is it there for? That's a, it's a really interesting like how do you learn safe conversation comes out of that though because i'd argue healthy application of safe requires many of those connections across topics and understanding how all the pieces interrelate but you can't overwhelm somebody learning it that way in a classroom setting even in a workshop or simulation settings get iffy how many things you can put in but if you don't integrate it in the wild you get a mechanical questionable implementation so we in processing it we wound up talking a lot about the idea of dimension journeys the what the the idea of dimension journeys so let let me share with you the kind of riff that went through that um there's a question that says to you if you open a specific dimension the way you read that dimension depends on the context you're in when you when you open it. Right? Where are we in our journey? Are we at the beginning, the middle, the end? Are we at a key inflection point? Will preset a scene for what's going to happen to you as you read that one. And there's a reality that says before you focus on this, you probably should have mastered a few others. And if you're at that context and that moment in your journey and you're going, hey, this is the thing I'm trying to do, but I haven't yet figured that out, then maybe the reality is I should be starting there before I go here. Uh, 
But then there's another thing that says, hey, once I've done this, what's the next thing beside it? And you could literally sit there and go, if this is my context, the thing that I should be doing is looking at these dimensions and these competencies because they're likely the things that are relevant to me right now. But before I plunge deep into them, I should probably make sure that I've taken, you know, full advantage of the round of competencies that should have hit me before I got to where I am. And we landed on this idea, and, and this is kind of the first iterative step. We're actually going to build like a little connection wheel for each dimension to go, if this dimension is at the center of the wheel, what are the dimensions that are most closely linked to it? And if you took, um, is it Lean Agile Paper, right? It's the first one in organizational agility. And <clears throat> it's fundamentally the dimension that says you're jumping into Agile business teams and you're jumping into HR. Um, they're the kind of two core resonant pieces of it. There's a couple of other things, but they're really the, the stress points that happen. And, you know, the challenge that I had as I wrote, uh, as I was doing my processing on it was, a lot of the things that I was tempted to say really belonged in Agile teams, right? Because Agile teams give you so much foundation, but then there's a flavor that says when I'm thinking about Agile business teams, there's gonna be, have to be some things that I tweak to the knowledge and techniques and approaches that I've developed working with perhaps Agile development teams. So it gives me a flavor. Then the other one that really links closely is Lean Agile Leadership because the other thing that it starts to talk about is you know, business leaders right? and, and business leaders living the values. But the reality is I should have covered that in Lean Agile Leadership. But the truth is for most people, if they started in technology, they're probably used to teaching these concepts and, and bringing technology leaders through the concepts and not necessarily business leaders. And sometimes that's a very different conversation. And so you can sit there and you go, <clears throat> I can really laser this dimension if I recognize that to get this properly, I also have to get agile teams and I also have to get at least one of the dimensions of lean agile leadership under my belt. And they were the two. And it basically we decided every time we struggle and we get tempted to put something here that really belongs somewhere else, we're, re we're gonna recognize that as a neighboring dimension. And we're going to start building these dimension relationship wheels for each dimension. And then we're going to use them as a navigation path through the episode. Get to the end of this episode and go, hey, the two neighbors are agile teams and you know, lean agile mindset, values, principles. Which one are we going to next? Because of the close relationship with them. But I think when you start to build those wheels of relationships between the dimensions, it might produce some very interesting things in terms of saying, if you are here in your journey in this kind of context, this is a set of dimensions to look at together to take you to the next place and perhaps some sequencing between them. A completely invalidated or unvalidated hypothesis, but it's an interesting hypothesis. Yes. <laughs> Like when I started picking up assessments and writing them in my organization, um, I mean, the Lean Agile Leadership and CLC are foundational for a reason, like they're on the foundation for a reason. Um, and I was finding that personally, like when I was running assessments is that if I were to run assessments across an art, it was consistently better, there was a better outcome of running those assessments and coming up with the action plans that come out from doing them if I ran uh, Agile Product Delivery and Team and Technical Agility and Lean Agile Leadership and Continuous Learning Culture um, across the art rather than picking one. Um, a lot of, because to your point, like when you get, when you get trained, you are I, I feel like a lot of the training is in order for you to begin to execute, um, to begin to do the job, not necessarily to like um, advance deeply in the job, right? Yeah. And I like the assessments and looking at the competencies because the conversation that you end up having with all the people who are doing the job starts to be deeper. And there's all the stuff that they ask you that you're like, well, I thought you, we trained you that 
on that. And then you think back and you're like, well, that was two years ago. Like, obviously, like, you're not going to, you're going to pick the things that you need from your training to execute immediately, not remember all the things all the time. Um, so I do think the, I like that idea that you've got of, in your hypothesis that things tie. I'm going to be curious as you continue doing doing that, how many of those ties actually do go back to lean agile leadership and continuous learning culture? Because that's mostly what I was finding, no matter what competency I ran at what stage in our transformation. I, I think I ran them all pretty consistently and in different areas of the business. Um, they all seem to need those. It, it's going to build an interesting meta map. Um, yeah. Because intuition and gut feel and core belief for the last however many years tells me that's going to turn up as your foundation everywhere, right? Because it's the make or break. But it'll be interesting to look how it emerges when you do that kind of iterative trace model. Yeah. Well, I think what's... Are you all, or when you're doing that, are you also looking at like the, the assessment questions at all? Yeah, um, I actually, I found the assessment questions were really good. I, I used them as a scoping tool. <laughs> mm. And and that was what happened when I started to fill the template out. I, I went, oh, let me look at what the assessment's saying at the moment about that. And I looked at the questions and I went, that's a really good place to begin the conversation to say, if you're looking to grow in this competency, the measure and grow questions draw your attention to the areas where you're likely to need to grow and actually help you to self-assess where you are in terms of the particular focus areas. But then as you drift your way through it and you start to go, who you're likely to be working with, what kind of problems you're likely to be tackling, um, you know, what kind of framework articles, whatever the question might be, every time that you get tempted to go, I'm going to throw this in, if you ask yourself the question, does this tie back to the measure and growth? it's often the hint to go, actually, it turns up somewhere else. Um, yeah. And, and to at least, you know, and I don't expect the measure and grow to be the full coverage, but they're a really nice anchor uh, to, to the thinking, which probably is what they should be given that it's measure and grow. But <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting having the... the the difference between like looking at the at the competencies and the statements solo or as an SPC or as a coach and looking at them while you're running them is I always got really um surprised like really cool outcomes, but very surprising outcomes of like I, I had one art that said when we went through APD, half of the people I, that were being assessed were like, I have no idea. Like, what do you mean when we talk like what do you mean lean UX? Like what do you mean? um story you know story user journeys i like i don't know we don't we don't do that and then the other half was the designers and the art and they were like yeah we do all of that we do it all the time but they were doing it and then keeping it inside of a hidden folder that was locked that nobody could access and so if you if i had just run the assessment without having the conversation or just looked at the had every individual look at the competency we would have probably ended up with like yeah we're awesome um, and we understand these things, but talking about it together with the people, um, and having like, a, actually two designers in that case tell me, um, well, they don't need to know it. That's what we're here for. They don't need to know how to do that. We'll do it for them. Um, being able to unroot those things. I think that's the power of, to me, of like the competencies of having conversations around them is there's a bit of like, I have to understand what I'm looking for as an SPC or as a coach. I need to understand if, uh, like, what type of things might be unearthed. But a lot about like, they're unearthed. Now, what do you do? And what do we suggest happen? It, that's, I think, a really, there's so many misuses of things like self assessments. Because I look at any self assessment tool and I've used the safe self assessments since they're an awful lot less sophisticated than this, the score is completely irrelevant. The conversation yeah. that it triggers and the insights it generates, both for you supporting them and for them recognising it for themselves. So we always used to run 
self-assessments as extended retrospectives. Uh, specifically these ones? No, like it's because I've been using okay. I've cool. been using them since day dot, right? And yeah. You you run it and you go, let's do a retrospective. Let's see where we are. Great. And you know, we'll we'll talk it through and you get all kinds of interesting moments and opportunities during it. But then I'd always close it out and go, okay, so we've got a score. Who cares? We identified a whole bunch of things. <clears throat> what are the three things we're going to focus on changing based on the conversation we just had? Great. And, and you just, you know, if you frame it as a, this is an extended retro for any given group, mm-hmm. you avoid the chance that people think it's about getting a good score. It's, it's about finding an opportunity. But I've seen a lot of organisations who think it's about collecting and aggregating scores. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I think, I mean, for bees, that was one of the reasons I liked them when they first came out is that, you know, the explanation for them, and this was as a customer and not as an employee of SAFE, was, um, was not go send this to people and have them take it. It was get everybody together in a room and have a conversation about each and every statement and your actions will come from that. Which I we still I still see a lot of questions about as we're coaching or helping people or when people, they ask question of, um, like I get like how do you easily collate these answers once you send it out to people? Well, you're not really supposed to do that. You're supposed to <laughs> like have a conversation with everybody because <laughs> um, that's the that's what you're moving towards. But yeah, I agree. It's the there's nothing better than like putting just really a sentence down having people say like how do you interpret the sentence um how are are we do you feel like you get it don't get it from the baseline like just do you even understand it and then are we doing it you've been very quiet it is interesting to me like there's so many things that you could do to do like art level and team level retrospectives and inspect and adapts and like what cycle do you put them on has always been like something i've been challenged with like do you do inspect and adapt for a PI and then you do value stream mapping the next PI and then you do measure and grow the next PI and then you like circle those or like there's just so many opportunities to gain different insights, different types of improvements because people are talking about things in different ways. Eric? My brain's spinning a bunch of different directions right now. One, I'm still back on the relationship between dimensions and finding myself wanting to do a um, directed graph and clustering of the strength of the relationships to get a visual of where those clouds are. Um, And it's an approachable problem. There's only 21 of them. So what is that? Um, A couple hundred individual pairwise evaluations. Um, The other one is like the, having worked for a tooling company um, at Rally being in the intersection between the desire to aggregate and evaluate and the coaching role of, God forbid, please don't do that. That's going to be horrible. <laughs> uh, it was a, it's, it's a long running, uh, almost emotional subject for me. Because <laughs> um, it, it's that tension, honestly, it's that same tension you see around velocity or something like that. There is value in understanding patterns at scale. And yet the value exposed by that may not be worth the risk exposure of having people starting to look at it. Yeah. Um, because people in leadership roles start to pull you towards, oh, so which team is performing better? And you, the comparative evaluation for learning and discernment versus the comparative evaluation for judgment is so dependent on the individual nature and the humans that are looking at it. And as soon as that whiff of judgment comes in, we know what happens. And things well, start that, to be it's targets. That, it's that nature of the organizational culture. Like on a completely different topic, I, I had one with a client because I'm a big fan of ENPS. And mm-hmm. the first rule of ENPS to me is you treat a non-responder as a passive because generally if they didn't bother to respond to the ENPS survey, it's a pretty good indication they're a passive. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Most people exclude them for the count. So you get a 30% response rate. You calculate a notional NPS on the 30% of people who can be bothered to respond. Uh, it's never going to give you a meaningful NPS score. 
because why do you measure it? Because you want to learn from it and you want to figure out what is driving where you're at and try and shift it. And so I had a group that started running their EMPS, got their first numbers back, showed them to me, and I went, something's wrong, show me the data. Because I knew the people on the ground, I knew there was no way that the EMPS was the number. And it was literally 30% response rate, and they excluded the passive, the non-responders from the calculation. I said, well, we're measuring this so we can figure out how to change it and work out whether we're changing it. Let's put them back in as passives. And so it really changed the number quite significantly. Um, and that became quite useful as we could watch the trends, we could get the data, analyzing the verbatims, always a really interesting exercise. But then we got to a moment 12 months down the track in a very political conversation where it turned out the rest of the organization measured their NPS using the exclude the path, the non-responders mode. And they went, what's wrong with your culture? Your NPS is so much lower. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, and it was a real moment of disjoint in terms of, you know, what's the reason you're using the number and what's the organizational context, whatever the number happens to be. Yeah, I guess, I mean, with, with both of the stories that you just shared, um, I don't, I guess for me, in my experience with like before I start measuring, we first have leadership conversations like across the leaders. And what I've mostly noticed is even in organizations that I've been at where I, I didn't particularly feel we had a great leadership culture, there were still people during that conversation that I had with them that were saying, hey, like, as we measure this, we need to look out for um, people starting to compare each other. Um, and I, I Even in like the most toxic places I've been at, I didn't have any group of leaders where there wasn't at least one people, one person who was bringing that up that wasn't me. Um, and if you can bring that, for me at least, like bringing that up and open and saying like, yeah, like that's what we'll look out for. Like, what are the attributes that we want to look out for and having the leadership team come up with what those things are, I think is just really good practice for, it's going to happen, right? Like there's the first time I think we I did a, business value scoring and we'd had a leadership conversation before and leadership conversation was, hey, some of our teams are going to take this poorly. They're going to to take it as being seen that they are getting a grade. Um, and we, you know, did all the things that you should do to make sh help like pad that that doesn't happen. But for sure and certain there was a particular art that started comparing all of their teams to each other and then to the other arts. Um, and were very hurt and hurt feelings and but because we'd already had the leadership conversation about this might happen we knew how to work through that and how to handle that and that it might be something um i think even in the most toxic places i've been i've i'd prefer to have that conversation first rather than not do something that can provide value to 90 percent of the people when 10 percent of the people might be really upset um you can work through that yeah, so my, my instinct is, how does that work on places where you aren't? Because that that is something I've actually recognized in our working together as one of your superpowers, is identifying the moments where you need to have had those conversations. And, and that's, that's a thing where I, I don't see that forethought reliably in companies. And it's one that even, like, I forget about. Like, I miss a lot of those. So, like... What's the safety? Where's the safety point if you're in an, or, an organization that doesn't have somebody with that mindset and superpower? Because I think that's where it starts to go super wrong. I, I mean, the only thing I can say is that we we talk through and and train and help people with systems thinking for a reason. Um, like those are to me like those are that is all systems thinking in my brain. It's it's what are the impacts? What are the connections? What's going to happen when? Um, and I, I mean, maybe that was easier for me because I, one of my very first jobs was as a risk manager and that's just what you do <laughs> is think through every possible thing that could go wrong and then put in solutions so that they won't go wrong. But I don't, I mean, I don't think, um, my 
when we talk about superpowers, that superpowers are things that you can't go build in everywhere. Um, it's just giving people those opportunities to see why they matter. Maybe that loops back to the opening point is a lot of things rest on lean agile leadership and the mindset towards learning. Yeah, I think they rest also on, I mean, we talked about this a bit before, like there's, what I tend to see is people skip steps, like, and people skip steps because they're oftentimes like asked to do something specific and like that ask is exciting or it's fr coming from a person that they never got asked for from before or somebody, you know, that they admire. And so they go do that step before doing all the things before it. Um, and, you know, training every leader matters. Um, you get to build relationship with all those people, like having a, having a lace that's sitting in the right area of the organization so that um, there is no blocker to having leadership conversations um, matters. Um, so I don't, I don't know how, uh, I think that's the one that always sticks with me, sticks with me is like, how do we help people definitely take advantage of them being asked to do something really cool, um, but do it in a really healthy way. Just to riff on the training for leaders step on the way through, because I can see Eric's thinking. Um, I think for me, the other huge value of training all the leaders, because I literally, I wouldn't take a client who wouldn't commit to that. And I'd leave a client if they opted out of it. That was just one of my rules of engagement. But one of the things that I found was you build relationship and rapport with them in the training room as well. It's mm -hmm. not just the fact that they're in the training room with you, but particularly as a lace, the people you've got at the front of the room in those, those training rooms for leading, say, four leaders are building relationship and rapport with the leaders. And they're priming future conversations. And that's in some ways almost more valuable than the training content from a transformation perspective. And the relationships that that room builds with each other. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. that's the beginning of actually having leadership teams rather than leadership individuals. You are you like still you thinking? Going Zen, Eric, where, where are you going? Hmm. Or he's creating some map across four different computer screens. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing the map, but I'm also really thinking about the... <laughs> relationship like th there's this there's this mental image and i'm trying to get words around it that is what's the what's the volume of or the the amount of effectiveness of beginning to become a systems thinker like there's a certain degree of an intrinsic skills and habits that any leader has or they wouldn't be in their role like i don't want to diminish that but i think about like the cost the challenge even we have making some of those relationships explicit and reading the fifth discipline and trying to it's like okay now we we're understanding these relationships better we're seeing the network diagram what's the lift to begin doing the to get good enough at that habitual enough at that that it's safe to dive into new practices that have the risk of harming culture across large scales like I'm, I'm thinking about like back when leading the CA transformation, seven different business units, um, any given each each business unit for just simplicity has three products, like a lot like the dimensions actually kind of structurally. Um, any one product group, hundred people, I could sit down, have those conversations with the leaders, create that safe environment, start to run the retrospective discovery cycles, I and mean, I can see a path to doing that pretty easily. I look at it at the business unit level. It's like, okay, I can work with the GM. There's a total of 12 to 15 directors in this group, 30 or 40 managers. Okay, I could, that's, that I can get my arms around and get to a point where that business unit could start to safely use new tools. And then I look across the 3,000 person engineering group with seven business units and like it's a seven fold increase in the problem size. And it's like, do I not try? Do I only do it at the smaller scales and just accept it's going to be a iterative, organic, generative process as others start to pick it up and hope it doesn't get out of control in a weird way? 
do I work with HR to do a leadership development program through this before we start to deploy this? And then I take something like measurement and think about the 30 other concerns that I need to have that same conversation. I'm back to, okay, so I actually need to teach the pattern now first around understanding the implications of diagnostics and, and, and. And I start to just swirl like, as a systemic, with a systemic goal, is it impossible? Do you just instead force yourself to start at the small cell and let it grow and hope it doesn't grow out of control? Like, so that's, that's the back and forth tension of, do you think about this stuff at systemic scale or do you think about it at local scale and then put in fire breaks to keep it from going systemic before it's ready? I heard you say I a lot there, Eric. Um, the I in the role of a change influencer in the center of a life. So the question that, that I'd ask you was, was the scale question about you at the center of the lace or the ability of those around you in the lace to do what you could do? Um, I, I had fewer members in the lace than there were business units. So it was a scaling question. And it could be, the answer can be and did turn into we treated each business unit as its own individual change and we chose where to put energy and where not to put energy and so on um and the areas that had their local champions were the ones that were successful as expected the ones that the local champions struggled to get traction with their leadership weren't successful in the same way i i mean i think one of the things that um cheryl and i have done very differently when we were in those positions is I think she did a really nice job of going across the world, honestly, and creating um, those strong groups, like creating creating these laces that could really tackle each area. Um, and she did do that one at a time, but she did that after getting buy-in um, from the you know the central leadership group, which I think is also really important. What I didn't hear inside of your options is um, is starting at the top so that you're not um because it sounded a little like you're explaining like i find a place over here and then i hope it grows rather than i'm starting here and then things are spreading because i'm creating um more areas that can spread um i find a lot of times maybe maybe not in intent of what you're what you were just sharing but in the with the world um, and I did it to myself a lot, like you're the lace leader and you have a lace group and all the pressure is yours and your shoulders are just slowly getting heavier and heavier. I don't think that's the way I, I feel like, like retrospectively and also learning so much from Cheryl, like that's probably means you're doing something not healthy for your organization, much less not healthy for you. Um, so being able to trust that you can go and create other people whether they're other lace groups or other um i mean most of my most impassioned change leaders were like vps of engineering or product or design or designers or um engineering directors like not the usual people you would have in your lace um but how do you like finding those people and having them be the people who make the goodness happen all the time knowing that every single week something not healthy will happen and that has to be okay. Or you just like, to me, like the risk is not going all in, like not doing all the things more so than doing the things and then having culture breaking moments. Cause there will be culture breaking moments all the time. And as you're building up enough people that can recover and recover and recover um, and have the right conversations and have the right conversations. And I don't think it's culture breaking moments because we're doing agile. I think it's culture breaking moments because you suddenly create an environment where people are actually safe to be transparent with each other. And people are wonky at scale. People are wonky at scale. <laughs> Quote of the day. <laughs> and I think that's that's the that's the tension I was trying to get at is 
individuals, conversations are relatively straightforward, kind, considerate, they, they'll try to figure it out at scale. Um, the, the nuance of the message gets lost. And maybe that's really what I'm puzzling through is how to, in the context of safe and thinking about the anti-safe sentiment that we see on a regular basis, like so much of the nuance and intent and sentiment of it gets lost by the time I'm hearing those messages come back. Like, and I'm not talking about the toxic just for the sake of a part of the actual, I legitimately don't understand this and I'm seeing it as something other than it ought to be or is. is. And keeping that fidelity of messaging and purpose solid as you get further and further out in an ecosystem and that people one degree of inspiration or now three degrees of inspiration from the ideas and it becomes more and more dependent on their ability to learn locally rather than having good connections with the center and all that kind of stuff. Um, center yeah. being the source of inspiration and a new idea, not the center of power and control. The distance from the origin might be a better. Yeah, that's fair. I, I mean, I do think there's a little bit of a difference there being within an organization or not. I mean, some of the, I don't know, five or six years ago, I had a really, for me, like depressing conversation with somebody who was teaching safe classes and bemoaning that people don't do well enough after they go and they don't get it and, and ask them like, well, what, what do you do about it? Like, what do you go and follow through with them about after they finish? And they're like, well, that's not what I'm paid for. Okay. But then don't bemoan it. Mm -hmm. Um, because you're not doing anything to go fix it. And I think inside of an organization, it's your job every day to do something about it. Like, um, and I could look at it from the reverse of like, yes, I was um, getting paid to do that, right? And if you're just getting paid to teach a class, you may not be getting paid to do it. But it was also just my passion of finding all these areas that needed help or asking for help, looking for help and doing it, whether it was inside of my role or not. Um, and I don't think I'm unique in that. I do think that there's a lot of people who are overwhelmed, um, who, uh, and, and I've been one of them. My company is so big. There is so much, there is so much all the time. I am overwhelmed. Um, and helping people find techniques for being overwhelmed. Um, and what do I do next? I think to me is like almost maybe more beneficial than saying like, how do I change more people? in the instance so that they're not as much of a concern long-term. Cause I don't, I don't feel like that's how human brains work. Like some human brains are going to take some sort of a class or, or an introduction and they will just like, this is now their path. They're going down that path. They're really excited about it. And then some human brains like, had an engineering director. It was his third class when he came up to me after the class and said, I get it. I'm going to start to release control. I'm going to go try and then finally tried. And it was like a year in after being like one of the groups where his, his teams were a hundred percent under his control. Um, so I don't, I don't think we get to come up with like, what's the perfect way to get that instant to happen, but we can help people figure out what they do next when they're overwhelmed. I think there's the moment that comes back to the, and your comment about the trying to really gel with me. Because training is the start of the conversation. If you don't continue the conversation, you've wasted your time in the training room, is my belief. And yeah. I always worry about people who are just trainers because my preference has always been the person who's going to be coaching should be the one training because you form the relationship and you begin the conversations in the training room and then you follow the conversations and you go, remember this conversation we started? in the room, let's pick it up again. Yeah. As opposed to sprinkle fairy dust. <laughs> we've, we've got to run a hundred leading safes in the next three months, go. <laughs> um, and I've heard stories about a few of those examples and not just in safe, any kind of mass produced agile training. Mm -hmm. uh, or any mass produced training. <laughs> But you did just give me a flashback to Toyota, actually, just listening to the two of you talk about the change agent and the change network. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that 
I'd never read about, and there were a whole bunch of things I learned in Japan that I'd never read in a book. Um, but this is probably one of the most fascinating ones to me was they have these guys, and I just had to go back and look at my write up to remember what they were called. They were called Jishuken, and it was a was like a title that wasn't your job title. Mm. So they looked for people in the lower ranks who demonstrated passion and talent for Kaizen, and they would enroll them in their Jishuken program. Can you type that? I can. Actually, I'll just share screen right now, and then you can see it typed. Anyway. Uh, I'll share the right thing. Share this tab instead. Here we are. So just here. Jeez, you can. Um, so these guys got identified and they went, we think there's hope for you, right? You could be great. And so as a parallel track, while they kind of stayed in their career path, they also participated as a member of the Jishuken program. And this was a hardcore mentoring on Kaizen. And they wound up as they kind of hit a certain level in it. They became the connective tissue of Toyota because when a particular plant, and, you know, that was the other kind of insight that hit me, go figure, it shouldn't have been a surprise. Toyota's a big place. It's not just one thing. And they have plenty of disconnect across the whole system, different countries, different plants, different factories, pick your poison. And one of the things they looked at with these guys is we want you to be ambassadors of knowledge and learning and improvement. So when a plant was facing a problem, right, needing to fix something that their regular Kaizen wasn't hitting, they take the Jishuken and send them uh, and they'd go, and this was the other thing, he, he was like, okay, well, we're Kaizen experts, but, you know, 20% is our minimum. If we go in to solve a problem, if we don't see 20% improvement, we've failed. Um, but they would go and they'd get called, they'd spend the time, do the root cause analysis, drive the Kaizen thinking, and then job done, back to their normal job. And the way they described it was these guys transferred knowledge because our continuous improvement folks in the Jishiken program were the ones who roamed the system. They transplanted knowledge from one place to another and they spread the knowledge of innovation, breakthroughs and different thinking. And one of the guys who was sort of one of the teachers and Factory guides for us. Actually, both of the Japanese guys were ex Toyota and ex from the Jishuken program. And they still climbed the normal ranks, right? They, one of them had wound up, he'd, he'd run the high ace factory. He was the factory, the, the manager for that for the last X number of years of his career. And the other one was also pretty senior in, the, in that factory. So they'd, they'd done the normal career track, but they'd also been what we would think of as the coach, <laughs> the, the roaming knowledge and improvement exchanger uh, alongside their, their classic job. And when I was listening to Rebecca speak about kind of activating the people in role, I was thinking about that, but it was also one of the things that I've often felt with laces from a development perspective is rotation is such a big growth tool, right? get experience in different contexts because then you can start to understand how different contexts influence things. And the more diversity of exposure you've got, the more your thinking grows because you start to recognize, oh, this hammer didn't actually work over here because I needed a screwdriver. And, <laughs> and it's one of the things I think a lot of laces struggle with, even with their own people or, you know, take your scrum masters, your coaches, your RTEs. Anyway, how do you get that rotation system to go, you know, you've got a job, but actually we're going to deliberately move you through different experiences and different opportunities as part of your growth path? 
But what I liked about I mean, the Jishikin thing was the fact that it was not, I'm going to change your job title. It's a different level. Sorry, Rebecca, I'll cut you off. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I did this successfully or not, but I think one of the things that was really important inside of even like besides the lace, like the coaches was really um, picking, like making, making something kind of like multi-tiered and saying, okay, if you're a coach who's really passionate, like you want to be the person who creates the workshops that we're going to run across the system, like the story writing workshops, feature writing workshops. You're always going to be doing that with somebody else that's inside of like mostly concentrated in their full-time role of being, um, you know, in, inside of a particular group that you're not in. So if I had all my coaches and they're spread out amongst, you know, two to three arts each or whatever, um, intentionally pairing them onto the other things that they need to be building or need to be doing um, across those areas so that we're getting the full perspective. But then I also was noticing like, it feels like even for my, for myself, but then also for like the different LACE members, there would be this moment where there's like, they're working so much inside of a problem area or inside of an area of the organization that they start to be so frustrated by it that there's almost like a, like a small amount of disdain starting to come out in their voice when they talk about that group. And I've noticed this in, you know, consultant partners too, as well as like, there's, there's something not right there. Um, and I think for me, like, that's the moment where I say, okay, I actually need you to, to not be in the lace for a little bit. And I want you to go do this job. Um, and pairing, pairing with the other business leaders to say, like, I'm going to loan you a product manager, like a junior product manager for a bit. They're going to sit under your product managers and they're going to do the job for a bit. And then, um, will loan back. And meanwhile, I'm taking one of their product managers that may, maybe has a disdain for agi agility and bringing them into the lace for a while. Um, but I, I think that like it very intentional, like when you're starting to see either the sniffs or building a, some sort of a matrix so that people are always having to pair across groups, always having to learn across groups. Um, that was one of, I mean, what, one of the things I always told my group and one of the things I never wanted to be was a group of people who was either ivory tower or, or ultra crepidarians, like people who talk about stuff that they don't have any idea what they're doing. Um, what was the term? Ultra? It's one of my favorite ones, ultra crepidarian. Um, crepidarian. Hmm. But the, I, I think that mixture is critical um, is it's so, so easy to, to get in that stance of, I know all of these things and other people just aren't either aren't listening or don't desire it or if only they would do this then and that's exactly like the wrong attitude you're looking for um so I do think sometimes you need to be force functioned a little bit to be like okay or something not healthy is happening I'd like you to go play the role in which you are finding that so much you know initial disdain for that role and see what life is like have you done anything like that or seen that? I've seen it. Um, watch people set it up a couple times and help steer it gently, but I haven't been in the middle of it. I've, had, I've been a generalist. I've played a bunch of different roles, but not as part of like a long-term internal rotation. I mean, so much of what we have to build is storytelling and empathy. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I mean, even before running a lace, it was being a, being inside of an organization, uh, two different ones. One of them was very intentionally like we're going to all do each other's roles every like, PI. So like there is capacity set aside for, you know, 10% of the people inside of these teams are going to switch roles um, and help each other do them. So I got to be a designer for a while. I got to be a UX person for a while. They got to be Scrum Master or RT for a while and doing that intentional like switching. Um, we Amazing things happen from that. Like amazing things for me, but also, I mean, we, we had a person who is an accessibility engineer who is 100% blind and was a contractor for us, learn coding so that we actually didn't end his contract. We brought him in as an engineer after the accessibility testing was done. Um, like that's meaningful. Um, and I, I think we can do that just broader at any scale. Like that was just a microcosm, but um, trading programs I, I think are critical the first medical device startup company I was at, we actually traded with hospitals for nurses. So they, the nurses would join the engineering teams for a while. 
um, and then they'd go back on rotation so that we were always getting the newest information. Did either of you ever read The Knowledge Creating Company? No. Okay. You should add that to it. <laughs> if it's the one I'm thinking of, I believe I pulled a copy of it off of uh, out of Jean Tabaka's bookshelf. Uh, it probably would have been the kind of book that sat on her bookshelf. Uh, mm -hmm. It was, I never know how to pronounce it, Nanaka and Takushi, the, the guys who wrote the new product development game. Um, mm. And they were actually, they were researchers in knowledge creation. And they wrote this book and the core theme of the book was the notion of intrinsic and extrinsic learning and that intrinsic knowledge can only be acquired by doing and extrinsic knowledge can be conveyed. And their notion was that you're actually looking to set up these loops that says you go through a period of doing to learn but then you can only systemize and scale the learning if you can turn it from intrinsic knowledge to extrinsic knowledge. And they gave all kinds of great examples. My favorite one that's stuck in my head forever was the world's first successful automatic bread maker. As apparently the notion of right, the bread making machines had been kind of the device they were trying to crack in the consumer electronics market for years. And nobody had been able to make a machine that actually produced a good loaf of bread. And one of the companies, I forget which company it was, they took one of their senior engineers and he went and did a six-month apprenticeship at a bakery and did his six-month apprenticeship at the bakery, came back, built the world's first bread maker that made a good loaf of bread because the knowledge that he'd acquired making the bread taught him what he needed to do in creating a machine that could make the bread. Uh, and that whole bunch of examples like this, of this, this kind of swapping of notion of, you know, do it intrinsically, convert it to extrinsic. Uh, and I think there's a thread there, and I think it's a thread particularly a lot of coaches struggle with, is coaching what they've never done. And, you know, there's a world where if your coaching skills are good enough and your willingness to go and acquire knowledge like mad so you can figure out how to ask the right questions is good enough, you can do it. But I think a lot of people try to coach what they've never done without that same thirst in terms of their soft skills, their pure coaching skills, and their thirst to fill gaps when they need to fill them. And I think sort of the trigger for this conversation, right, in terms of that rotation and people in the role the, the coach who's cooked and you need to move him somewhere else is, is part of that, that notion that you're trying to create intrinsic learning opportunities. Yeah. And that, that sounds like a book I should read that the, my initial ones is actually um, from my first, you know, real job where we had a, it was a startup. So all the fluffy things, right. But we had a dream manager um, as a, job like there was a girl there who worked there and her job was a dream manager and she reported to CEO and she met with every single employee there and her job was literally to help your dreams come true um and as she did that like so many people were just like I just want to spend time learning this other skill um and that's just stuck with me for so long because I, I do think like a lot of people actually desire this um, Robin Yemen did a great talk recently actually about this with um, software and hardware engineers um, and building, you know, spaceships and space hotels and such of, you know, when she gave people opportunity inside of these teams, the software engineers were like, yeah, I want to learn welding. And they all went and welded parts and vice versa, like they came back and did coding. And I, I think people want this, um, want the time to be able to do something that's new and interesting. Um, and doing that also just makes us more empathetic. So just makes better teamness. I still feel like Eric's about to come out with some sort of like crazy I don't network. Know he's, I don't know whether he's back on his network diagram or he's Googling something before he talks. I'm well, I've seen a backlog of things I want to say because we're doing longer segments. 
<laughs> I don't think it's intentional. I think we're just chatting. <laughs> oh, there's just a bunch of different. Like this is this is one of the more. Uh, I, I moved into intentional passenger because I'm really learning a lot from the interaction and getting a bunch of ideas. Hmm. Um, and as a result, I've had a big pile of interesting to me um, places to go with this. Um, one is uh, when to go back to the thing you shared, Mark, and asking Jashukin and its relationship to the chief engineer role and like the keepers of the curves, and then the relationship to leadership. Like, how is that wandering mentor interact with the in place experts who are expected to be the tacit knowledge current connectors of their domains around them in each space? And then onward to the role of leadership, because two of those three are not authority roles, but they're respected influence roles. Chief engineer has an authority role in one domain. So that, that, that's one area. And then mapping that over to how does that play with the distributed lace pattern? What is that? Inf is there a fourth shape that we need to sketch out for laces that encompasses that mindset? Um, many micro centers of excellence or a dispersed expert base that comes together in a virtual lace at times. And how does that relate to a guiding coalition? So that's some connections. That's that's a lot out. of connections. And that's just the first line. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I can do a very quick response to just a little bit about this guy. Mm -hmm. Because he, he did an hour and a half with us in the room once about what it meant to be a leader. It was unplanned on the agenda, right? The main way that we worked was we had a morning in the classroom. We learned some ideas and then we went and saw a factory and then they showed us those ideas in reality. Uh, mm -hmm. But he had an unscheduled hour because everybody was thirsty and he went, I'm going to give it to you. And it was just all riffing off the cuff. But I think one of the most powerful moments he had, and stop me if I've shared this story with you before. I, I definitely haven't shared it with Rebecca though. He said, you know, a leader has to be a bad news guy. You've got to create a bad news culture. And the reason you do your gamble walks is to see the bad news and then see whether your managers bring it to you. <laughs> because you, none of your managers actually wants to bring you bad news. And you've got to create the expectation that the thing that's not okay is for them not to bring it to you. And you've got to set out deliberately to create a lot of awkward moments with them um, to, to teach them that if they don't bring you the bad news, you're going to know it anyway. Uh, but the, the kind of riffing on that, you know, the seniority thing, I think there's a respect associated to somebody who knows how to do a particular job, even if they don't know how to do it in that context. Right, and and is it the is the it's one of the reasons I love internal laces so much is because you get people in the lace who speak the language of the company. Right, they can rattle off the acronyms the company speaks, and everybody goes, "Oh yeah, I know where you know, what your journey in the company's been. I just heard five acronyms. I know exactly the type of bosses you work with." Blah blah blah. Right, so that you get that notion of respect because you're from inside the system, not outside the system. And I think that's a bit of the puzzle, but I think the other bit of the puzzle was he wasn't necessarily there to be an expert on fixing a specific problem. He was there to be an expert on fixing problems. And he brought knowledge of how other places had fixed similar problems and what kind of strings to tie. Um, but every time he described a problem, he, he, he described one that he'd done in a like five-stage supply chain to us and the way that they thought it through in terms of optimizing the usage of trucks for transporting parts from the suppliers to each other and to the Toyota factory to reduce the shipping costs for the suppliers so they could reduce the shipping cost to Toyota. Uh, and he took us through the technique and the way he'd approach it. And I was like, oh, my goodness. And it was just his thinking patterns, the questions that he asked and the rigor that he used in <clears throat> you know following a very structured process about gathering data and you know boy did he smack us about the head in our kaizen exercise when we wanted to start improving before we had an accurate commitment as to what we were going to improve 
And then when one of the groups tried to improve the wrong thing, he really riffed on how much waste they were going to create with their improvement. Uh, <laughs> so I, I do think on the positive side, that notion of the traveling person with the right mindset, but also with the respect of coming from within and having a real job is huge. There was a second half of that question, comment. Um, and it was the, so there was the inherent respect, but also the kind of three-way relationship between the authority hierarchy, the technical knowledge hierarchy, and the wandering coach dynamic and how that social plays out. And Rebecca needs to end soon. Then yes. Rebecca, share. Um, so Rebecca, if you want to do closing thoughts while I refresh my coffee, we won't have some dead air time while I get my coffee in a minute. <laughs> No, I mean, I, I guess my main closing thoughts are, I just really appreciate the, I, I appreciate the problem state of it is difficult. It is hard to have um, healthy change happen healthily everywhere inside of a really massive organization. Um, I also feel like um, fear is, is not the way to make it happen. So fear of having a manager do something wrong or having a leader say something that is terrible. Um, for me personally, I would still rather go try than and try hard and try big um, than not. Um, and I see this reflected in almost every uh, group of people that I do coaching with or consulting with and or chatting with or have led before when when they think about like, do I want to take the courage to do something where the end result may or may not be positive, but if it is positive, it will be a game changer um, versus do nothing and sit within an organization that I do not believe in. Um, almost always they would rather do it. And I think encouraging that and encouraging a lack of not not a lack of thinking, not a lack of being pragmatic, but not being run by fear, I think is also really critical. And because I'm right now not running on food, which is also a state of fear, <laughs> I'm going to go eat breakfast with my husband. You enjoyed but breakfast I'm... with your husband. It was lovely having you join tonight on a very different yeah. conversation. Thank yeah. For, thank you guys. Thank you very much for getting up and joining us. It's lovely to have a just an open conversation with you like we do one on one, but this is like extra with bonus mark. <laughs> bonus mark. <laughs> That's really what you are. Yeah. Uh, Job. But if you want to pop up the share and come up to where I'm at or I can bring it down to you. Uh, yeah, sure. You. You've, sure. Got, no, you've oh. got a great <laughs> You've got a grid. You've got a grid. There we go. There we go. We're back to being amateurs. This is what happens when the talk gets fun. <laughs> and you still got the frame highlighted, but I'm in it, I think. I don't know if I can drop an item in a frame while it's being highlighted. I've, I've, un I've unhighlighted it. And it looks like um, it's in it. Yeah. But anyway, the um like the fact that I can multitask, do this, and I'm not really putting much thought into what I was doing here. It was the hardest part was getting some ideas on clustering, like just put, putting weights that might really generate an interesting graph. And I'm iterating this in real time without having to um, think about the structure of plant UML, think about the relationship, have a server that's generating it, whether it's localhost or elsewhere. Like I think about the number of steps that used to be involved in this yeah. or finding a commercial package that does it and hiring, buying from that vendor and doing it there or whatever. Yeah. versus a general purpose data analysis that I had a side conversation with during a meeting yeah. and have data based on real data by the end of the meeting. Um, and the, the reason for the layout on this one, the thinking I decided to overweight everything else's relationship with the Lean Agile leadership and then have middleweights within each competency and lightweights elsewhere. That was the sample data to generate a graph. Um, but it was like the speed of doing this is change will change the nature of things. Yeah. Now go back to that and ask as a coach, 
if my instinct, and I'm not going to say this is good coaching. Um, in fact, I'll even say this is bad coaching. But if my instinct is the old form of write a story and then during sprint planning, talk through the tasks and put an hours estimate to make sure no specialty is overloaded, blah, blah, blah. Not relevant. Sorry. No. Like the idea, like hours per task shouldn't be a thing anymore. Like not from an estimate point of view, but the idea that tasks still take hours as opposed to kicking, thinking about the outcome you want, setting up a structure and kicking off a job. Yeah. Now, what does that do to multitasking in our conversations? We usually have about how many things you should have. In one. Um, is it appropriate for me as a developer to kick off a 10 minute job and sit there and stare at the screen every time? And yeah, I can be thinking about what's next, but if what's next is driven by the end, the nature of my interaction with technology and my work just changed dramatically. Yeah. But um, does that does that render our conversation of whip as a coach no longer relevant? Pairing, mobbing. Do you want the whole mob to sit and stare at an AI job running for ten minutes? So I th I'm gonna I'm gonna play with that for a second, right? And, and I'll play with it from a coder perspective because it's an easy one. Mm -hmm. Um. And it's fun to remember when I could code. Uh, if I think about it as a coder, if you get distracted, right, you kick it off, it takes 10 minutes, and you decide to do something else while it waits, what's happened to the thread that was running in your brain as you composed the job? And what's the cost of picking that thread back up? Right? Because you could um, kick it off, you could, you could do something else to be productive in the 10 minutes. You want an answer? Give, well, give me an answer, right? Follow the thread. Well, so so it goes back to my definition. What's what's the difference between collaboration and interruption? Whether you're working on vaguely the same thing or not. Mm -hmm. So before, to break up a story or even a task with interruption is going to collapse the castle in my head. Yeah. And I think there's a great XKCD around that where it's like, starts out with a for loop and kind of gets bigger and bigger and there's this huge director graph and then somebody taps them on the shoulder and there's like <laughs> <laughs> um, if that person is asking me about something that's in that graph though in my castle it actually strengthens my castle yeah it's collaboration if they're asking me about something that's outside and i have to load a different context then it destroys the castle or harms the castle. and i think about that with multitasking too it's like we, I, I think the natural state will be multitasking different micro experiments in the same space. Now we shouldn't be, I shouldn't be bouncing out across 10 different features. Yeah. Like thinking about how to evolve the marketing of my web page at the same time I'm thinking about how to improve my OBS setup and at the same time I'm trying to build the outline for the next thing I want to record while writing on the book. Th those are different contexts. Like yeah. they're all agile, but they're different contexts. But if I'm playing with OBS and test recording and practicing the script for the thing I'm about to do as I'm doing the test recording, that's kind of all the same container. Yeah. And I'm bouncing back and forth, but I'm actually accelerating the whole system. Look, in terms of eliminating, and that's, I think, the thing that's made AI very real to me recently has been the productivity implications. All right, the productivity implications of AI are just astronomical in terms of the cycles of freeze. Well, I'm I, no argument there. And I think we're probably just, I don't think we're adding any conversation to the world with that one. No, but I'm, I'm looking at this, if we start to think about it as, I mean, actually, let's just run this experiment. Um, I, I don't know if I can do this easily. This one, this one was uglier because it's noise, but if I were to, uh, can I share this? Share a link to, yeah, actually, yes. Um, copy link. Uh, I'm just going to drop this on the Miro board as soon as I figure out where I left Miro. So I put the link to the chat that generated this right there. Now, if you, if you skim that chat, I, I bet you can quickly tell me what mistakes I made, what I was trying to recover from, and you have my context that I used to follow, build this micro experiment. Yep. I'm not just handing you an output. I'm now handing you the entire interaction that led to that output. Yeah. 
and that, and that could get scattered across multiple chats. Uh, yeah, so like, and that could get scattered across different chats and different AI tools and stuff. So it might not, it won't be as clean. But the ability to share thinking and process through something like this, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I went back to a older chat, older by a couple of days to like touch something. And I remembered vaguely what I was doing. I remembered enough to go find it, but reading, skimming through the chat was like catch up. It was loaded fresh in my brain. Yeah. That just changed the dynamics of multitasking. So if you riffed on that for a second, but then I actually want to come back to the coaching mentoring discussion, mm -hmm. <laughs> given that there's so many people in the world who know so much more about our hour than us. The connection that maybe was formed for me a little bit there was if you think about the really common strong style pairing, it was one person at the whiteboard thinking about the next piece of the puzzle and going, I think we should use pattern X in this fashion. So it was treating the person at the keyboard, like if you think about mobbing, the instruction in a mob is the person at the keyboard is a dumb input device. They're not, they're not allowed to turn their brains on. And you can do a certain level of abstraction to say, declare a method called X as opposed to saying type these characters. But in a mob situation, it's turn your brain off. In the classic strong style pairing, it was, I'm going to give you a bounded problem to solve, and then my brain's going to start thinking about the next bounded problem to solve while you at the keyboard solve this problem. So it was like you had two brains running in parallel. And the brain that was thinking about the next stage of the problem didn't have to slow down to do the grunt work of actually implementing the solution. Uh, and then periodically trading places at the whiteboard. Uh, so well, and Falco was a huge fan of it as, a, as an example. Mm -hmm. uh, apparently it was very common in the pivotal pairing stuff. And there's a world in which you start to think that you could do strong style pairing with ChatGPT. I'm thinking about the next questions I'm going to ask it. The next problem I'm going to get it to solve for me while it solves this problem. Um, yeah. Well, and I, I, I had a moment yesterday where I had uh, two or three chat GPT windows open on the other monitor with different questions running on each. Yeah. So, and, and where I was going with this isn't about the how to use AI. That's something you and I each need to learn along with everybody else in the world. Yeah. The observation I had on this is in a, I, I don't think any of the principles become wrong, but I think many of our practices are now going to be invalidated and we don't know which ones are why. And the cache refresh that's about to happen for what does Agile look like in organizations that have embraced these tools? That's, that's the big one that's, um, got me lit up this week, but also has me deeply concerned about the future of agility. I mean, it'll figure itself out. That's, uh, that's... Companies do that. That's what capitalism does. But the people that are currently coaching it and leading it, many of whom are good friends of mine, it's going to be interesting. That, that's, um, that's not where I thought you were going to go. Oh? It's a valid place to go? go. So you start out with the observation about mentoring versus coaching. Uh, right. The... Um, the place I was going with the mentoring versus coaching is we're going to hit a world where none of us can mentor because we yes. haven't done it because the, the it has changed so much. Yeah. And if I added a twist to that, the twist that I would observe is there's an awful lot of people who call themselves coaches and are mentors. Like, I, I, yeah, I, I dropped the coaching language for myself a long while ago because I realized I was not acting as a coach most of the time. But there's always been a little bit of a tension if you think in terms of pure coaching interpretation. The concept of an agile coach actually busts the purity of a coach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, putting the adjective on is like, huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think there's a lot of underdeveloped coaching skills and they're hard to develop. And that's where I thought you were going to go was AI is making mentoring less and less relevant because you can get such powerful answers from well-trained AIs. I actually don't, I don't think, I don't know if that actually is 
it yes, it's true, and I don't think it makes it less relevant, but I think it changes which things are mentored. Because yeah. um, a mentor provides self-awareness. A mentor tells you things. Yeah. And it's not just about knowledge. It's not training. There's a difference between training and mentoring as well. Yeah. Um, but as a mentor, I, I see myself probably in real time asking an AI behind the scenes to give me a list of things that I should be considering as I engage with my client and actively mentoring them. Yeah. Because um, that's one thing I, I noticed with Eric GPT yesterday is getting it to filter down and not give you 10 different answers is quite challenging, which is also true of Eric, but <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, the, the, the act of filtering of value doesn't exist. And that, that is valuable, like yeah. helping to narrow and focus. Um, and AI can send you down a wildly wrong path as you focus. If it doesn't, because it can it does not, it does not yet have the context and meta context to guide you. Yeah. It's just going to generate good advice. And the options it generated as I was testing it were phenomenal. It's like, oh yeah, like one of the test cases I used was, um, I, I'm a leader with 10 teams in my release train, five of them are ser service trains, and I'm seeing a lot of delays up for the front end teams. What do I do? Yeah. Like I, I tried to give it a real problem that would come <clears throat> up. And it gave a reasonable list of directions to go look, couched as go do this, each. <laughs> did you um, did you feed it your Fireflies transcripts? Um, some of them, not all of them. Like I didn't put the stream sessions in, but I did all my coaching on the couch, and I fed it. Uh, I ran four years of summit talks through the uh, Fireflies, um, yeah. and then I gave it the text of the first book draft and a couple other things. Cool. 200,000 words. Turns out I talk a lot. 26 <laughs> hours of me speaking. <laughs> um, tempting to run some like old uh, transcripts of like teaching and stuff through. So I've um, not for recording sake, but for live uh, multi-language transcripting, I've run leading safe and stuff through Otter as I've taught it. Yeah. Um, so people could see that as if they weren't English as a first language. Um, so I'm tempting to take some of those types of things through and get all the stories, but maybe that's over time. Hey, that's an interesting thought. The the voice simulator AI I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. That's today's. Uh, that's on today's oh. backlog. Um, <laughs> what what what, what happens? I'm being too well behaved with myself. Yeah, I'll find the link and. Uh, I'll pop it into well, a chat. Let me. I, if, I, I know see, when I when up. I decided to be very well behaved. When I decided to be well behaved, I went and just bookmarked it so I could find it again later. Oh, the Eric. Uh, the AI voice change. You were uh, saying something. Yeah, so... I'll, I'll find the bookmark while you're saying it. Um, so I'm going to give you, actually, I'm going to do this in a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, if you could share this and make sure the link doesn't show up on the, uh, stream. Right. I will in just a second. As soon as I've used the tab that I'm on at the moment. So, right. Tab, 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 tab. I've lost my Twitch chat window somewhere. There it is. Uh, that's the ABS tutorial on the AI voice changer. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I was getting ready to look at a couple of those today and see how that played out. <laughs> so where where I was going, and where, where have you sent me the link you wanted me to? Uh, back channel, or 101. Oh, okay. I was looking at back channel. Um, so you'll, you'll be interested to hear, um, I did actually record... Uh, about five minutes out of every hour of like snapshot updates of what I've been learning and where I'm at. And then a couple 30 minute blocks of the more interesting, like here's the, here's the real, real time of me trying to figure out uh, Eric GPT in the, in the editor. And I'm going to time bolt it to get it down to um, get the dead spots accelerated. Yep. So I tried to, I tried to practice not talking. 
<laughs> it didn't always work. <laughs> as as these things don't. Um, it's interesting being it's interesting being in a recording because I I narrate what I'm doing more and it actually drives my thoughts better. That is interesting. Is that just because you like listening to yourself speak? I mean, there is that. I've made a career out of that. That was the other smart-ass comment that I note, wrote down is the definition of consultant is somebody who's five minutes smarter than their client. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh. Bring this over here so I can see. I've, uh, better. I've lost my screen share. Huh. I finally got it on the Miro in a nice, obscured way. It looks like I need to do a quick new video ninja. Give me a sec. So while I'm resharing, um, my theory that just popped into my head was from a translation perspective. If you train the voice mod well enough, you could give it an English transcript or a, a translated English transcript into another language and get it to your, use your voice to deliver it in the other language. Be a nice little shortcut, right? Interesting. I don't know if Spanish speakers would want to hear it in my voice. <laughs> Be a fun experiment, right? I, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, auto, auto, so run it through the auto translate. Hope it's a good translate and you're on record. I mean, th this is where the the elements oh, so, to my voice, to my tone, to my habits. Like it's more than just words. There um, we go. So, so we, I don't know where to start uh, on this, but it was um, with what I went through yesterday where it inspired me to share the way you said it. Um, maybe kind of go up to the goals. Okay. Just above the I, backlog you're on. I, I, I did just a cheap and nasty screenshot, which I probably shouldn't have done. Let me. Um, actually, you, yeah, if you can hide the URL. Uh, no, this is, this is on the stream area URL. Oh, you moved it over. Okay. I, I moved it because the window I've got set up has the, the URL in got it. Got it. And I was trying to find a okay. way to hide the fact you hadn't you. secured it. All right. Um, where are you at? Okay. I've stayed where I was. There you are. And okay. why don't you talk through your goals? I'll make another screenshot. There we go. Okay. Um, also, so just the concept I was, this is the thought process I went down yesterday. Is like, if I want to catch up, what do I really mean by catching up, understanding AI? Yep. And in the context of application. So not just learning the foundational stuff for learning the foundational stuff sake, but learning the foundational stuff to apply it to myself, to my career and everything else. And there were kind of like four things that influenced each other in cascading that really drove me. And the first one is personal productivity. And we yeah. kind of talked through a lot of elements of that. You and I've been bantering on that. And what is AI for my personal professional use? And then what does it look like in a corporate setting where it's not for the mass, there's one element that's like mass productivity, but then there's a second element is, okay, now I'm training models on corporate data and using that to provide value add services to clients. And like, as the middleman producer of AI driven capabilities, um, so consuming, presumably consuming the large models and the enabling frameworks from vendors, but using those to generate value add. That's what I mean by corporate setting here. Yep. Um, what does that look like? And what does that do to the organization structure, the relationship structures, the habits, the product management approaches, and so on for a customer, for a potential customer for a corporation? And then given that, and it has to cascade in this order in my mind, given the personal productivity use and given the corporate goals, What's the implication on how Agile looks? What is the new better if we're uncovering better ways of uh, creating AI and helping others do so? <laughs> um, so and that, it's creating, you did, creating you software set, in an AI-driven world. You set yourself an easy set of goals for an eight-hour day, right? Yeah, and then from there, <laughs> let's cascade Agile coaching. Yep. To be fair, it's the weekend. After I get off the stream, I'm doing another two days of this. Yeah. Um, because <laughs> I need to be completely wiped out when Chelsea gets back Tuesday. Ah, um, right. You gotta seize the moment. But just digging into that very first one, it's like, okay, what does prof personal professional look like? Yeah. There, there's the product user elements, and then there's what are if I want to build some micro models of myself, whatever. What are the tools there? Um, speaking of remembering to be a developer, 
I'm, fascinate, I'm fascinated by the implications of bringing architecture and I, I still have the coding mindset habits, even though I haven't coded actively for 10 years. Yeah. Pair that up with Copilot to do the typing for me. Okay, now, am I a developer again? Like, seriously, not, not, a, not a joke. Like, if I, I couldn't sit down and ha slam out C-sharp code in the same way, and I'm not up to date on the libraries and models and stuff, but if I had an AI whispering all of that to me in real time, yeah. how, how hard would it be to actually become a competent developer again? I don't know. I'm going to go test that. <laughs> um, and why not use the entire GitHub stack and learn, relearn that? Because when I stopped coding, GitHub was a really cool new thing that I was getting to know that one of my um, favorite ex-colleagues went to work for. Um, and then really dig into small models and things like that. So that's that's this is just in like the first first category. This is all like first domain. <laughs> this is where AI is really bad. It took me five years to stop thinking of myself as a developer, and I've had numerous moments since where I've been tempted to start coding again and gone, no, that's not what I do because I know what happens if I go back into the coding vortex. <laughs> and you're heading yourself back into the coding vortex. Maybe. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, the last the last five times, seven times that I've started getting into coding, the shaving of the yak around doing it kept me from actually going anywhere with it. the like, oh, as an individual, it's actually this hard to set up an environment, and then it's this hard to relearn a language and oh the language has changed and oh .NET is on what version nine now what and yeah. like by the time I get over that learning the the shiny is gone yeah. the chasing of the fireflies in this case um but with AI making it easier that that lift I I can't imagine that lift being different or harder it, it would be different but it, I can't imagine it being harder like renting server space and doing this and that and the other thing, like all of those are different conversations. You, you've just got to ask yourself the question, and this is the question I ask myself, is is coding again driving the impact that I'm trying to have on the world? <laughs> um, ah. Well, the, it's not about going back and learning to code to be a developer, though. It's going back and learning to code to understand the world of the developer again, because it's not the world I left. Yeah. And and that's that's the part. I need I need to understand what's possible now if I want to be an effective leadership coach. True. Um, and that goes back to the coaching and mentoring conversation. Like, I can I coach somebody from a lack of experience but help them find better outcomes? Sure. But yeah. is there the value proposition of being able to properly mentor? at the same time is, it, to me, exponential. Interesting. Um, how many stances can you fluidly rotate through as, the, as in order to serve the relationship and the client? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting trade, I'll say. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, you know, the idea of writing and creating content around agile stuff that doesn't take into account the current reality, much less the emerging reality doesn't feel very useful for the world either. Yeah, I guess it kind of depends. There's a piece of the puzzle where it really depends at what level you're thinking when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, if you separate the productivity stuff, I think for me, a lot of the AI stuff, because I've done so much work in the data science space, coaching there mm -hmm. with predictive and prescriptive models, everything I can see in the AI space is so far following patterns in terms of the implications on your workflow, but they're patterns that I had to learn the hard way in the world of predictive modeling. Because the reality is anything AI, AI is truly iterative. <laughs> it's not, it doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. Right. And, and that was, you know, the, the thing that I learned in the predictive model space was, you know, you iterate a model and, if you try and break a story, anything other than an iteration of a model, all you're doing is tasking. Mm -hmm. 
iterate the model 10 times, iterate the model 10 more times. <laughs> uh, so, so you wind up thinking about learning goals and decisioning goals. Yeah, I haven't yet seen, I, th I think this notion of how much can shift the productivity and the expectations around productivity is interesting, but I think there's another world you, you, you layer it on, and, and this is probably the world that I get more interested in on something like an AI front, is given the risk sensitivity of the world, what are the implications for an organisation as they face into the risks in the space of AI? Because I think a lot of enterprises desperately want to leverage it. But if I think about an awful lot of chief security officers and their organisations that I've dealt with, the panic that will arise in them as they try and deal with the influx of demand for this is going to actually be a very interesting thing to play with. Mm -hmm. Finding ways through that. So, yeah. But just, I mean, all of this, the, the point I have is all of this changes many underlying assumptions on which the current frameworks and everything else were built. It doesn't mean they're not relevant. But the reinspection of those underlying structures yeah. and evaluating the efficacy of the practices that have emerged around the frameworks, and yeah. I, by that I mean things like story pointing, whatever, um, start to change things. Like if a, if a let's let's take story pointing just as a useful example, if not a funner marginally tiresome, tiresome one. Um, if we think about um, uncertainty, doubt, um, knowledge, like in the dimensions, like the the driver of um, story point estimate on something like this might, is probably going to be more, in the future, is going to be more like uh, friction to get ready to do the iteration and expected number of iterations, not complexity, effort, and doubt. And it's like, okay, that's a, it's actually still valid to try to put a container around iteration or yeah. put a container around the size of something for all the reasons that it's healthy to do so today and with all the risk of the unhealthy symptoms. Yeah. But the nature of what you have to consider is different yeah. dramatically. Um, how, much course, how, many, how many people have updated their course materials to incorporate that consideration? Well, then that's I where I start to get into like this. This is the thinking that's been going through my head for the last uh, 16, 24 hours, really. Yeah. Is this implication level and so what that comes along with any interesting new tool for me? Okay. It's an interesting one. Um, the other interesting moment for me is uh, I, I noticed you pulled in a little bit of my value stream map, the high level one. Um, so I brought going, in the. This one here, yeah. I, I brought in the top to bottom of it. I didn't bring in the detailed one. Yeah, the detailed one's a bit much, but um, what was interesting is going through that and maybe just zoom out a little bit um, so you can see the vertical flow. Like thinking through the overall transition flow of this, uh, of all the different steps. Are you going to? There you go. I'm settled. Yeah, I'm just gonna. I was just gonna. It's easier to look at. Um, the, uh, yeah, because I wasn't aligned. There you go. There go you go. It. And you missed it. Somehow you missed a chunk in the middle, I think, too. Or no, I guess it was sizing. Um, Whatever. Going through this, I, I, I mentioned I didn't value stream mapping first because I had to th understand where the tools are going to apply. Because I I'm not one who just says, "Ooh, shiny new tool. I'm gonna." pick up this tool and it's like, I want to pick up this tool and apply it into a workflow and test it out and all that. Yep. The um, inspection of AI tools uh, forced me to do the value stream mapping, which emerged weaknesses in my current approach. <laughs> As value streams are wont to do. So I actually fixed a few really, uh, a few risk points. Like I had some, I realized my video library wasn't being backed up to the cloud. So I could easily, if something happened hardware-wise, lost all the videos, or at least all the raw content, yep. things like that. And it's like, interesting, as I start to look, that part of Agile still works great. Yeah. 
um, but every step within it could potentially be reimagined. It is interesting, isn't it? Maybe it just comes down to whether your practices are a principles-based person. And, and are you applying the principles to purpose? Yeah. Like there, there's the purpose element here. Is that, and, and that's, if, you, if, you, if you take it back to something like story playing, uh, and I don't want to get into the, the huge thing, I've come to a conclusion after many years that says for the typical team, by the time that they actually figure out how story points are meant to work, they don't need them anymore. <laughs> no, they're, for teams at a certain point in their evolution, they're a wonderful design tool to help a team get better at doing designs because they force you to think through things that you might not otherwise in a collaborative upfront setting. Okay. And that's my value. Story points are estimation is a design tool. Same way test driven development's a design tool. Yeah, I, I think of it as a requirements exploration tool and solution thinking. Uh, yeah, but it's the, the numbers. And, and it's fine, fine in that context. Throw away the answers. Well, it, it's that thing, right? You can go back and you can read every article re ever written on how story points are meant to work. And then you watch your average team. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> go figure. And there comes a moment when possibly they're ready to do that. But usually that by that moment, they've got really good at slicing small stories. And just counting stories is going to be far more useful for them than anything else. Or yeah. well, they don't, they don't even do that anymore because they, they do... Uh, yeah, lead time on teacher side speeches. <laughs> yeah, but I guess, but if you look at that, slicing small stories is also an, a design approach. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you don't need two design approaches. Yeah, that's kind of the point you're making, and that, and I think that's the that's the overlap thinking that you learn over time. It's like, what is it? What problem? What's the purpose of this practice in the context of the principles, and which way of achieving that purpose is best for this team at this time? Yeah. And which one's easiest for them to learn and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And and that purpose and principle driven, and I, I actually want to keep purpose and principles as two different things, I think, as I talk about this. Because one is the overlay of how and one is the pull through of what goes through yeah. that how. And they deeply interwoven because a different purpose creates a different set of practices very quickly. Yeah. That's LPM. Yeah. Is that LPM 101? I mean, it's, it's the core triangle message of LPM. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. But anyway, the, all this to say where the AI will shift where the focus goes, and we will need to reassess which practices are best suited to drive various outcomes. And I wonder if our community at large is ready to do so. I'm not. I'm working on it. I'm becoming ready. I and probably should be question. thinking about more than I am. I don't know. I that's a diff different question is how does our community become ever more ready alongside the evolution of all of this? So I, I think the interesting thing here is, and if I look at the way that I am using numerous AIs every day, and if I look at what you're using this for here, is we're gaining the intrinsic knowledge with a purpose driven by our content creation. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so we're not chasing it just for the sake of gaining the knowledge. We're just chasing it for a certain purpose, and we're we're going to learn on the way through that. Um, I think the challenge for a lot of folks is, what are you chasing it for? <laughs> well, that's that's where I ended up categorizing. I, I pulled my tool mapping in, but don't want to go into the detail of it, and it's just didn't takes all the steps on the one we were just looking at and lists out the ways I accomplish those things today. So it brings the tools underneath the workflow steps. Yeah. Uh, but if you go up to the top, I, I or just kind of look in enough, you can see the gray post-its. Um, yeah. I tagged them with, with Miro tags to say whether they use AI as core of the value prop or if AI is a toy in the context of that tool. And, you know, like, because that's, I mean, companies are playing with this. They're, yeah, I mean, Miro absolutely. is a classic example. You have that little AI thing in the bottom right, and I played with it a little bit. It's a toy. It is yeah. not yet an inherent part of how somebody's going to interact with Miro as a capability. Yeah. You look at something like Fireflies, and AI is core to the core value of transcription, yeah. at least really good machine learning. I don't know if you want to call it AI or not. And 
pretty solid in the context of providing the summaries and the outlines and everything else, which is part of the core value. Yeah. That's AI core. That That is AI solving a problem instead of AI looking for problems. <laughs> yeah. Um, but as I went across this and worked the way down, I was surprised how little AI I use on a daily basis. Yeah. It's prevalent. It's present. It's all around me. But it's not yet critical to my workflow in a lot of places. And that's that's probably, if I go back to my list of goals, um, now that I've played built the first GPT, I'm probably going to try to play with tuning it a little bit this morning. Um, and then my next two tasks, one is to play with the virtual avatars, the virtual voices, and the other is to look through this pipeline in detail and think about where can I get massive improvement out of AI. Yeah or other tools I'm not yet considering. And that, I think that's the key thing. It's not just about AI. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, like, could, oh, I should put that in there. Could, like my courseware hosting platform has like AI course, driven, AI course generation. And I'm like, do I really want it to partake of, whether I'm, a cre I'm the creator or not, do I want to attend a course that somebody typed a topic in and got an AI driven course outline and then recorded? I, I know. Mm. <laughs> I know. Anytime I click on a YouTube, that's and and they're becoming more and more prevalent, right? I click on a YouTube that looks interesting, and you can figure out it's AI driven within the first ten seconds. And I hit stop. Mm -hmm. And weirdly enough, there's a very interesting mix of quality of content on. Amazon Prime, and I could swear they've got AIs generating some of their documentaries. <laughs> well, they do. Oh, they, they do. do. There you go. Um, well, going, going. There's a, there's a little bit of a. Um, I don't want to call it a controversy because I don't think it's actually at that category. But there's a conversation happening. Um, Stardock Gaming used um, extensive AI quest generation and voice generation for its new game, uh, Galactic Civilizations 4. Um, you read into the developer blogs behind, it sounds like they made the decision to do that with like two months left in the production cycle. <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. And what's interesting is the variation of procedurally generated quests that I was encountering, it, was, it still has the repetitive nature that procedural generated quests generate, but yeah. it's not nearly as bad. And it's voice acted. There you go. So it felt much more crafted. And it wasn't like an uncanny valley feeling. It was just better than the classic here's 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 fifteen here's your here's your library of six quest archetypes, here's the variables to fill in. And I'm I'm watching the development of this really interesting little sandbox game, um, Archmage Rises, that is doing that. Right. And it's a small team. It's like four people, five people, I think. And I learn a lot from watching those developer teams go through their work. And it's one of the ways I stay connected to the development community still. Hmm. Um, but but the different in nature of like AI for storytelling, it's actually going to be a pretty good thing if you can get it past the canned feel. Yeah. Which and one it's getting one? easier and right. easier. Because um, like, maybe, I'm gonna, actually, that's an interesting one. Um, Use Eric GPT to generate examples of conversations for specific principles. <laughs> it, it's on my backlog now because it, it could probably generate some really interesting coaching examples that I could then tweak or refine a little bit. Yeah. And have a couple of voices narrate, and then we can talk about the principles that were in there as a coaching exercise. You just it's now an AI driven coaching kata. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I reckon you can tell I'm going to geek uh, out on this for a while. That is meta enough. I'm going to release you into geeking mode. I just did the the glance at the watch. Uh, okay. Have a fun geek. <laughs> I'll I'll see you uh, the opposite side of our time zone split. Uh, yeah. I'll just take um, take us to the outro.